Welcome. So, oh. welcome to the fifth night of the 11th annual Gainesville Jewish Film Festival. I am Virginia Brissett Hershick, and I'm the president and CEO at the Jewish Council of North Central Florida, which is one of the two organizations who coordinate this film series. It is my privilege this evening to introduce Dr. Norman J. W. Goda, the Norma and Irma Brayman Professor of Holocaust Studies and the director of the Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Florida, who is our co-host in the series. Um, Dr. Goda studies modern European history and specializes in the history of the Holocaust, war crimes trials, and 20th century diplomacy. He is the author and co-author of multiple books and journal articles on the Holocaust, and his work has been the subject of stories by the New York Times, the Associated Press, U.S. News and World Report, and other major news outlets. Dr. Goda has served as a consultant to the U.S. and German governments, as well as for various radio, television, and film documentaries in the U.S., Europe, and Israel. And most importantly to me, he was my professor of World Civ at the University of Maine a long, long time ago. And it is rare that you can come back around and thank one of your profs for helping you get to where you are, but thank you. And it's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. And with all the faculty and others who've been participating in these talkback sessions, it's really a treat to get the context and sort of the, the ways in which we view these things through different Jewish lenses. So it's definitely my pleasure and privilege to hand it over to Norm, who's gonna be our moderator tonight. Thank you, Virginia. And thanks for the kind introduction. And thanks everybody for um, coming to these sessions and for supporting the festival. Um, I'm going to try not to make an ass of myself. I, 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 found the, um, I found the film to be extraordinary, but I, um, I kind of got fixated on the title because it, it, did, it obviously is not yet another movie um, about Jews who escaped Nazi Germany for the United States. In fact, that entire part of the movie is given short shrift. Um, rather, the, the focus is on um, Georg Goldschmidt um, and, and his, his life and his musicianship and the Jüdische Kulturbund and, and all of that. And, and so I got thinking about the title, Winter Journey, which never really comes up in the film, but which is an allusion um, to uh, Schubert's uh, series of, of songs um, grouped together in a, in a work called Winterreise or, or Winter Journey um, from the 1820s. Um, and, and the film, to me anyway, seemed to be uh, a, a big allusion um, to that. Uh, and, and there were numerous references to it, it seemed to me, throughout the film. Um, uh, Winterreise, or Winter Journey, um, is a cycle of 24 uh, lieder, or, or songs. Um, they, they are all in a minor key, and, and therefore they have this uh, very doleful sound to them. And the main character in the Winter Journey um, is um, a, a heartbroken um, man uh, moving through uh, a cold, dark, uh, frozen um, German landscape, um, uh, completely brokenhearted and with his heart frozen. Um, the Jüdische Kulturbund, um, this doesn't come up in the film, but the Jüdische Kulturbund liked Schubert a lot. Um, they played Schubert more than anybody uh, except for Beethoven and, and you know, various reasons, according to musicologists, one being that um, you didn't need an entire orchestra to play uh, leader, and they were always sort of short on woodwinds, as, as Goldschmidt's job with the um, Jüdische Kulturbund Symphony sort of makes clear. And, and second, the Nazis were not in love with Schubert uh, in, a, in a way that they were in love with um, Beethoven. He was Austrian, he was viewed as somewhat uh, as a feminine Viennese, you know, and, and that kind of thing. But it seems to me that um, the film makes reference or, or sort of oblique references to various things um, within uh, Vinta Reise. So the, there's um, one particular song called um, Frühlingstraum or, or Dream of Spring, 
where the the singer says, I, I dreamed of Green Meadows, sort of looking back to better times, uh, similarly to the way that um, Goldschmidt looks back to this park uh, near the Oldenburg Castle, uh, where he and his sister grew up, but also um, the trip that he and his wife took on bicycles outside of Berlin um, shortly after the war began. Um, there's another um, song called Die Post, The Mail, um, where the main character in Winterreise is hoping uh, against hope to get a, lever, uh, a letter from um, his unrequited love or, or any letter at all, only to hear that the post brings no letter to you. Um, and and the, uh, the letters that he didn't want to get are, are the letters that he got and then stored um, uh, and, and when, when he reads them, you know, it, it's, you, you can sort of see why no letter <laughs> might have been better um, than the letter he received or the letters he received. And finally, I, I thought it was really interesting that the last song um, in Winterreise is Der Leierman, the, uh, the organ grinder, um, sort of an, uh, a beggar musician, a social outcast, uh, um, organ grinding on the ice who no one hears and whose plate, um, his beggar plate is always um, empty. No one listens to him. No one wants to look at him um, in the song. And I don't know if you saw it, but there's this very brief moment when he's talking about where he and his wife lived um, uh, near Prinzenstrasse uh, in Berlin. And there's, uh, I, I tried to, I tried to, um, I tried to, um, you know, do a do a screenshot and failed miserably. But um, there's a there's a scene there of a, of an organ grinder that just sort of comes in and out of um, out of the scene. And there's no reason to have that organ grinder in um, in that particular scene other than to make a, a reference to this. And then, of course, um, the uh, the traveling through desolation as a lone traveler in in the Arizona desert. Um, really kind of works with this too. There, there are all of these shots of him, uh, you know, sort of from the back of his head as he, as he sort of winds his way through the desert and those wonderful scenes of, of it snowing um, on the cactus and, and the ice breaking off. So, so even the desert kind of becomes a winter landscape referring back to Schubert. Or maybe I have the, the completely the thing um, wrong. But um, you know the, the other main piece of work that's kind of referred to um, here is, is Mozart's Magic Flute. There, there are others in the middle. You know, we played this, we played that. But um, uh, uh, Mozart Magic Mozart's Magic Flute was, um, he says, uh, foundational for him um, in learning to play the flute in, in the first place. And the son um, really cannot figure out why he simply stopped playing the flute um, because he was so um, he was so capable at it, and there was this um, there was they they show the part of the magic flute where Tamino you know they, they ask of Tamino is he virtuous is he fearless is he wise um, and you know possibly he um, felt that um, in in light of his uh, escape from Germany or maybe his relationship with his father through the mail and, and that sort of thing that he wasn't. But in any event, um, if, if it was the magic flute and those, those things, uh, virtue, fearlessness, and wisdom that inspired him to play the flute, then maybe doubt about those things um, made it so that he could not. And, and this journey of his, this winter journey, I, I you know, even goes, um, sort of in retrospect through uh, the winter of Nazi Germany, some of the, some of the most amazing um, uh, effects to me were when um, he or the actor playing him was walking through um, these iconic photographs. I, I, I've never seen an effect like that. It doesn't mean no one's ever done it before, but I've never seen an effect like that. And I, I'm always kind of ambivalent about Photoshopping people into still photos, but this was this was something um, very different. So I, you know, I thought it was really a, a fascinating movie. Um, uh, 
you know, the, the way it's sort of um, tied him together um, with the Jüdische Kulturbund and, and, you know, of course, Germany in the 30s more generally, um, but, but also uh, to the various um, musical works that uh, are, are sort of foundational to the film. So I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. It also picks up the theme of the tragedy of immigration. Yes. You know, and it ties in so nicely to some of the other films. I, I thought one of the failings of the movie, I, I, I'm talking like I make film or something like that, the failings of the movie, you know, but one of the things uh, about the movie I, I thought was kind of unfortunate was um, his father comes off in that letter um, as rather harsh. But you just didn't go into the U.S. Embassy and, and get a couple of visas, um, you know, for, you know, transit visas for, for Spain, Portugal, and, and um, tickets so that, you know, you get, you get all the way to Lisbon. Um, uh, and then, you know, unlike everybody else in Lisbon who has to hang out there for months or even years, you, you hop right onto a ship. That never happened where someone just, just went in and got a couple of U.S. visas. And so clearly the father must have thought that he had some kind of pull or something, that he, that he wasn't deploying for the rest of his family, when in fact it was probably just luck. Sorry, I didn't hear the last word you said. Luck. Luck. Yeah. Oh, I'll jump in. Uh, I was one of the screeners on this one. And um, one of the things that I really enjoyed um, was, and I'm not a big person for reenactments, uh, was how well um, the reenactments worked in this and the play between the past in black and, and the black and white and the present in color. Um, for your reading of the the, the title, um, he gives the citation for that journey, which is, I came a stranger, I left a stranger. Mm -hmm. um, but, but like you, I was really impressed with the sort of um, surprise um, games with the photos um, that, that worked. I was also struck by the, the tone of the father's letter and just the tone of, of the son. Um, but in terms of memory and in terms of the resistance to memory, the two things that struck me the most were his, his journey, uh, Crystal Knopf, um, uh, as, as just monumental, even though, it, you know, what happened on the ninth, uh, his father, the trauma of his father, uh, but also his uh, willingness to forget his bar mitzvah. Um, mm. I, I found um, really sort of, you know, poignant moments, but I, I have to admit, um, you know, it's an extraordinary story and the, the, the sort of ambivalence about participating in this group. Um, but for me, what, you know, put it on the thumbs up list what that it gave me was really the, the, the visual work. I thought it was pretty extraordinary. I just want to say something to what uh, uh, you just said, and that is that this was like one of, of, I don't know how many dozens of films I'd been screening. When I saw it, it seemed, it seemed interesting and I asked Gail to look at it. And Gail was really taken with it. And sort of, it really made me far more excited with the film than I initially was. And re-watching re it, re-watching it, it's like, I said, wow, <laughs> it's a hell of a film. You know, it's... Um... Oh, Elaine had a question. Not a really a question, but a comment. Um, you know, as I was watching the film, I was thinking of uh, <laughs> our former... <laughs> His name just left my my uh, my brain, my old brain. Um, help me, help me. Give us a hint. Huh? Give us a hint. I'm going to give you a hint. It was before you came into the position. Who was oh, in Ken Wald. Ken Wald. That's right. Okay. <laughs> now it, it was Ken Wald's family story. Uh -huh. Did mm -hmm. anyone connect it to? I connected it almost immediately. Mm -hmm that uh, it was the same story and Ken Wald's parents came here and, um, and Goldsmith's parents came with him. He didn't come alone at the age of 22. He came with his parents. It was his grandparents he was talking about that, that 
the letters were from his grandparents, just like the letters that Wald received were from the grandparents. And I was struck with the, um, how, how it followed the same pattern uh, as Ken Wald's story, so that there was an element of actual truth since it was verified by the film and by the, the show that we saw about Ken Wald's uh, grandparents, uh, how they tried to get here and they couldn't get here. Um, I do agree with you. I thought it was you know, somewhat ridiculous that they go to this uh, uh, American consulate and where they're wined and dined and this is late in, in the 30s. This is not early 30s. This is- It's 41. 41. Hmm? It was 41. It was really late. Yeah, it was really late. Yeah. And most people couldn't get out at that point because um, if you remember the, the ship that was turned away from Cuba, that was in 39. Mm -hmm. So very few got out. Uh, how they managed to get out, they had to have influential people who were either related to them or friends of theirs that fomented this way of them escaping. And I was really touched by um, the, the, uh, the, the lead uh, actor in the film. Mm. I was touched by him in the sense that the reason he was a furniture salesman and not a musician. And he said, you know, and the truth of the matter is he had such guilt. It was his guilt that kept, kept him in the job uh, as the furniture salesman. He didn't feel that he deserved to be a musician. Mm. That was my take on, on it. And, uh, and, and it was the winter of 41 that was so terrible. So now he sees everything through the winter. Now I'm not a, mus a musical person. I'm, I don't really know a lot about music. Yes, I listen to it, but I only don't Know, know much about it, one about the, the famous uh, 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 writers, but uh, but I I was impressed with the music that accompanied the uh, the film. I thought it, it it just flowed very beautifully with the film. I was very taken with the film, mm -hmm. uh, as I said, probably mostly because I connected it to ten a uh, Ken Wald story and his grandparents' story. And, uh, and it's another story of the Holocaust, you know, and I guess, I guess we're just, you know, we just are, just, we just have this feeling that we must always refer our Judaism to the Holocaust. Uh, I know I read everything. I don't wanna read it, but invariably, if somebody gives me an article or a book and it relates to the Holocaust, I will read it, even though I don't really want to. Uh, I've had friends that were or, or, uh, survivors of the, close friends that were survivors of the Holocaust. I had one particular friend who was in the concentration camps. So, you know, I can relate to this very well because of her stories. Okay, I'm done. Well, I, I'd like to jump in. I really like the film. I, I would say I love the film. Um, it bears watching again, maybe even three times. There was so much happening in it. And the way that it was woven together with uh, current time and the old films, I want to make a couple observations and I'd love to hear what other people think about this. I was confused in the beginning. I had to pull out the program to find out whether it was a documentary or it was fiction, because it opens in Sabino Canyon, where, I mean, I've gone skinny dipping in Sabino Canyon, and I've hiked those hills, and I know that they don't let cars drive in anymore. So it started off seeming like it was gonna be a documentary. Um, I didn't recognize Bruno Ganz. I looked him up later on, uh, and, so the beginning and the way that it started, I found jarring. I'd like to know what anybody else thinks about that. And it was only when I left it and came back maybe 20 minutes into the film that I had a new perspective on it and just 
let it flow and it came together so beautifully. Uh, another scene that really stood out for me that was jarring was very close to the end when the son, who's actually the son in you know real life, the author, um, he was so hard on his father. And it it's not like that was a foreign interaction with me, but it seemed so different from the way that he had coaxed him to tell him more of his story and had succeeded by taking it easy. Uh, I didn't understand why he was so frustrated with his father. I guess that was the scene where he goes into the closet and pulls out the letters. Um, but I'd love to hear any, any other perspective on those two things in particular. Heath, I agree with you. I thought that was the least successful scene in the film. It seemed out of character, the kind of uh, rage that the son was expressing. <clears throat> but, but, you know, it's not my film, it's his film. So <laughs> the other thing that you say about the fictional devices, I, I agree. When I first started watching, it took a while to, for it to dawn on me that the guy who was playing the, fa the father was an actor. And uh, until I realized he was dead, well, they obviously had to be an actor. But I kept seeing him as Hitler, and <laughs> because if you saw Downfall, where he's he's the central character, he plays mm -hmm. Hitler in the bunker. I just mm -hmm. kept seeing, my God, this is this is the guy who who plays Hitler. He and did do the Hitler. Uh, he did do a reprise of the Hitler thing, though, with the Gestapo officer who was giving the exit visas. Right? It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. So I I thought that that was really quite quite something, and. Um, uh, there was something about that that really struck me that I wanted to say, and, and that is that, um, ah, it'll come back to me later. Ah, I know. The thing about this film, and, and it's something worth all thinking about, if you compare it to, let's say, um, uh, Moranov, <clears throat> that the film is, um, part of the reason why this film is so good is because of Gans. He's such a good actor. And that I, I wonder what happens if you remove him from the film. Like you could spend the entire film just looking at his face, looking at the emotions on his face, the way in which he moves us, the way in which he convinces us. And he's an extraordinary man, extraordinary actor. And I wonder if that's not even better than the story itself. And the device of his son never appearing in any of the scenes, right, right. That, was, that was interesting really puts the focus on the father. Yeah, totally, yeah. Yeah. Can I interrupt again? Last night I put on PBS. And who was on PBS last night at, uh, I guess nine o'clock was Martin Goldsmith. <laughs> now, if that wasn't a surprise, <laughs> and he was hosting the show about music. Mm -hmm. And um, and they were playing the music, and I watched it for a while while the music was on, and then they did fundraising, so that's when I turned it off. And but it just struck me so. Here is the son mm -hmm. talking about the music. So he was also a musician mm -hmm. and very knowledgeable, and uh, so it was a, a nice comparison. And the thing that struck me about, about the actor is when I first saw him, without realizing it, I, for some reason I thought it was gonna be a Jewish actor. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, he doesn't look Jewish. <laughs> but it didn't make a difference. He was a marvelous actor. He played mm. the part beautifully. Absolutely. He was mesmerizing, to be honest with you. He was mesmerizing, yeah. yeah. Um. I think I think I agree that the son was sort of the the weaker link in in this film. I think one of the things that um, is perhaps important to bring up is uh, that the film is um, is also about testimony, right? And um, how you tell uh, about such an event, about such a traumatic event. Um, and I thought it was very special in the sense that um, you, you know it. It sort of challenges our perception that testimony, you know, seeing testimony as a sort of holistic or a cathartic process, because we you know, we have this father who didn't want to tell the story, 
and then the son who just wanted to you know to expose and listen to the story and you know of course there, there's a whole philosophy the son is not coming out as an empathetic listener he's he's really pressing his father to you know to tell the story instead of sort of going with him through uh, 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 more gently and more empathetically. Um, but then at the end, we realized that there was, there was a reason why the father didn't tell the story, right? The, the twist at the end with this letter, um, which made, you know, made it all such a, a, a traumatic experience for the father. And I felt like the film at that moment, right? When, once we get that letter, we see the, the, the frustration of the family with the, with the, with the you know, relatives in the United States and sort of the inability to help and, and that failure. Of course, that was the reason why the father never shared the story. But there's also, you know, there's never a healing process or a closure. I mean, the movie kind of ends and the son that kind of pressed to hear, you know, to listen, to, 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 to wanted the truth, sort of didn't know what to do with that truth um, at the end. Um, if um, uh, I, I think this is kind of one of the things that that stood out. And I mean, in, you know, when thinking about testimony, a lot of the philosophies, if you think about the centers in, in Yad Vashem and in the Holocaust Museum, I, I, we, we get the sense, you know, a, a lot of the people that record Holocaust survivors talk about how they see, um, you know, Holocaust, um, Holocaust survivors, not just, um, not just surviving uh, um, to tell the story, but actually telling the story to survive. And here we see a little bit different approach with, you know, with Bruno Gantz's character, uh, right? We see how, how testimony and the story um, is not necessarily a mechanism of release. Um, so I, I was wondering if, you know, you want to join in on that. Um, I, I wouldn't mind um, following up a little bit because I didn't read um, some of the not wanting to tell as only the letters. Mm -hmm. They're hard and they're sort of the, you know, the summit. But uh, the ambivalence about Judaism um, was was becoming more and more apparent um, for me, not just he didn't remember his bar mitzvah, but there's a moment where he does a great job at wincing when he hears his own name um, and who he is. Um, but there's the the also that uncanny moment of, of this trek on Kristallnacht to arrive at his in-laws house and, and they're gonna play music, right? So I, I thought that it was also that this, you know, even though he was part of the, of the Bund, if you will, um, there was constantly that erasure, I wanna blend into society. I want to, um, uh, the, uh, the wife's family is going to cover. We can play music here, we're safe. Um, so, um, but in terms of their pulling of the relationship and, and devices, I really enjoyed um, the interspersed phone calls. I thought they did a really interesting job um, getting the sound, and I was wondering how he got such good sound um, uh, on those prompting phone calls when he would find something and call his dad in the middle of the night. It, it, it's, it's, it's not even that they play music, they're playing Beethoven. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, no, I mean, you know, I mean, with, with, um, I mean, first of all, it's why should I remember November 9th, even though November 9th is is the, the turning point for so many, but um, that that they're playing Beethoven and it gets at that whole issue of um, of how they continue to define themselves as Germans, you know, and just, just stubbornly continue to define themselves um, as Germans. I, I mean, I thought the other ambivalent thing about him, not only the letters and the um, and uh, his Judaism, but there, there was also this uncomfortable business of the, um, of the Kulturbund itself. You know, it, it's sort of portrayed in the movie as, as practically a collaborationist organization, which I don't think is especially fair, and he didn't think was especially fair, because he was just a guy who wanted to play the flute and make a living doing it. There's no evidence that the Nazis ever used this as um, as propaganda, even though I guess they could have if they wanted to, but uh, it, you know, um, just as this whole thing of the culture <coughs> and, and how it's portrayed 
in the film in, in sort of this retrospective teleological way. Well, of course they should have known. And, and, and even the son was, you know, well, you should have known in 1935, even though most Jews were still in Germany in 1935. But I was, I was curious what people thought um, about that, uh, the, 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 you know, the, not, not so much the notion of um, Jewish musicians continuing to play for, for Jews and playing German music for Jews whenever they could, um, but uh, just, just sort of the way it's portrayed in the film. I was surprised because it's usually very um, Israeli thing to do, I mean, right? Uh, uh, the, you know, for years, Israel maintained the, 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 the agenda that the Jews in Europe were led as sheep to slaughter. Um, and, and, and the sort of Zionist Zabra, Zabra ideal was to, was to leave that sort of passive uh, uh, type of, of Jew, right, and, and create a new one that, that is able to defend itself. Um, so for me, the, the, you know, again, it sort of shows a, the little bit of the, the, you know, the lack of empathy that the son have, almost blaming his father for, you know, for not getting up and, and leave. So it was kind of surprised, you know, surprised that it came from, from this direction, from a family member. Mm. But he seems to also, I mean, yes, he's blaming him, but I, I think he's also calling him out that the guy didn't want to be Jewish. I mean, pretty much everything that he does um, uh, tells that story. There's only one moment where I feel like um, the trauma of, of that, I mean, maybe it is in the forgetting, but the trauma of that is when he said on the train, I saw the synagogue burning mm. uh, as he went past. Um, but, but short of that, um, pretty much everything he does is to escape who he is yes. and, and fall into the music and blend into the nation. Well, that was a very powerful passage. Yeah. Actually, right? I mean, really, it was amazing. Yeah. That was quite, very common among uh, German Jews. Very common for them to uh, not think that they were Jewish. They were German. There's also his recognition that he was very lucky throughout his whole life that he escaped danger multiple times. He made it to the United States. He had a happy marriage. Well, I mean, I think that was the impression I got. And um, there was some synchronicities that might be the right word, but there were things that were happening in contemporary life with his father that kind of had echoes of how life had been in Germany. And one of them I'm thinking about, it relates to winter light is there was a scene in, in their apartment in Germany where it was snowing. His wife called him over to come look at how beautiful it was out in the garden. And then later on in the movie, we see snow on the Sonoran Desert. I, you know, I lived there a long time, and I never saw that much snow on saguaro cacti. I mean, we got those scenes of the snow sliding off the saguaro trunk. It's just phenomenal. And it, it made me think about how unusual that that was life in the desert and that it was an echo of life in Germany, yet so different. So the snow was real? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. It, it does happen on occasion. Okay. Not often. Not often. And maybe more often now. They've got a water shortage. It also depends yeah. how high up you are. That was the desert floor. Is it this one? Whatever. Okay. But it does happen. It's, yeah, it sure. I've good. seen it. It snowed yeah. while I lived there. Yeah. But not that much. I never saw it that deep. It was beautiful. All right, I got to go. This has been great. Thank you for sharing. I need. My final thing is I love the movie. I yes. really enjoyed the performance. Uh, I thought it was, I, you know, I sat here spellbound watching it. I thought the actor was terrific. Uh, and I thought there was so much. Uh, just suggestions, a lot of, so every scene had a suggestion of another aspect. In other words, there was nothing straightforward. Everything was sort of, and I'm trying to think of the right word. I have a problem with words at my age, but everything was just always together with another scene. 
that the no, scene. It's, it's a very okay. finely crafted film. And that's yeah, the, uh, a very, very finely crafted film. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's time for me to take my dog for a walk. I enjoyed the movie. I enjoyed the discussion. Um, I got different perspectives. Thank you, uh, Dr. Co Goda, and uh, <laughs> and you. <laughs> But uh, it was really a, uh, it was really a worthwhile experience to watch that movie. I, you know, so have a good day and thank you so very much and thank you, uh, Virginia, and for you, um, Doctor. I'm looking at you. I knew your name. I know your name. Why can't I think of it? Yeah. That's when you get to be almost 89 years. Doctor, Doctor Jack. Dr. Oh, Jack. Dr. Kulikmas. <laughs> Jack, Jack. But to be honest with you, that was, that was, I was, I enjoyed, the, I, I saw another film the other night, and I have two more films to see, uh, which I also enjoyed very much. Good. Uh, thank, so, thanks for coming. Thank, thank, so thanks for, uh, for me, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. For me this year, uh, I, you know, because I think, well, last year I didn't go at all. Nobody did. But last two, few years I have seen very few films because a lot of them just didn't appeal to me. But this year, uh, the ones I picked, four of them I picked, actually five of them appealed to me, but I took four. And, uh, and I'm waiting to see the other two. I know I'm gonna love them. If I could just tell you something about that, and that is that don't pick by what you think you're gonna like. <laughs> just pick <laughs> by, take, trust me that I selected these films. And if I selected these films, they're good films. So you may surprise yourself by going to films that you wouldn't think you're going to enjoy and you get something out of it. There are no bad films in this series, none. They're all handpicked to well, be very good films. On the, on the topic, I guess. It's the topic that I sometimes object to. But I will say that the films, I, the four I feel, I really am looking forward to the next two, which good. I will see. What else are you picking? You want to know what else I'm picking? Uh, um, the funny one. What's the funny one? Okay, the kiss, kiss me kosher. Kiss me kosher. Huh? Kiss me kosher. Kiss me kosher. Okay. No. Be interested to see your reaction to it. Gail okay. and I had very different reactions to that film. <laughs> I'll tell you what. What film? Just give me a minute to get tell you. I have to go take the dog out, but I will tell you. Uh, <laughs> There is. Yeah, I remember nothing. Oh, the dog is by the door. So. Anyway, uh, the, the last film I'm, gonna t uh, I'm doing is about the Blacks and the Jews. That has always intrigued me. It's, nice it's a very Shared nice film. Yeah. 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 So I'm going to watch that one. Another one is like a comedy. But, um, I, guess it, I think there's only one comedy, and that's Kiss Me Kosher. Yeah. yeah. And the, one, the other one I saw, I really, really loved. It was Mishmash. It was about Good. Egypt. Oh, that one I think was good. really, really amazing, amazing. And I, I didn't thought, think people would care for that film too much. I thought it was uh, a little bit challenging, but it is, it's a very interesting film. It's a very, very interesting story. Very interesting film. And I, I really enjoy, I missed the, the talk on it because I had other things that I was doing, but I just love the film. And I'm Elaine. sure I'm gonna love the next two. Elaine, I can send you a link to a YouTube if you want to watch the talk back. We recorded it. Which one? Uh, for Mishmish, if you want to listen to the talk back, I can send you a link to the YouTube. Oh, okay. I'll try it. Yeah. Because yeah, okay. I love that movie. I really love that movie. Yeah. I think most everybody who saw it had good things to say about it. They thought it was really interesting. It, and it's just unusual. These, these brothers that were so brilliant mm -hmm. never got their due. That hurt. Yeah. Yeah. Again, the, the tragedy of immigration. Listen, my parents came from from the uh, from Europe. I'm a first generation. So my, my father came from uh, what was known as uh, Romania, but it wasn't Romania. It was uh, it's now um, the other country. And my, my, my mother came from Ukraine and, and where my father came from was you could walk over a bridge to the country he came from, Moldova, Moldova. Mm. So, so I'm first generation. So I have a, a link to, uh, and I found a cousin through, uh, ancestry, not ancestry, 23 and me. 
Mm. I've got a couple of cousins that we didn't even know I had. One of them came here in 92 and she is living in New York City. And um, she was one of my father's cousins. And um, she, when she came here, we, she, remember she went through World War II in Russia, in Ukraine, in Ukraine, right near Moldova, right near the border, right near the border of uh, the, the, the uh, water, you go over the bridge and you're in, and um, she and her family basically were saved uh, by, uh, after the war, when the, uh, after the war, they, they survived the Nazis, but after the war, they were starving to death. And, and another cousin, actually her grandmother's sister, that's, that's, that was the cousin that was in the States and her grandmother was the cousin that was there originally during World War II. And she would send them packages, continue, she would go through the family, raise money and buy stuff or gather stuff that was, you know, anything, anything she would send them. And this cousin told me when I spoke with her that uh, if it wasn't for those packages, they wouldn't have been able to live. They didn't have anything, nothing. Uh, if they couldn't use what was sent to them, they sold it for money for food. So that's a story post, uh, post Holocaust story. And she came here, that's when, uh, what's his name? Gorbachev let the Jews out of Russia. Okay, good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Everybody, the, um, thanks for coming. Um, thanks for viewing the film. Uh, there is no uh, film tomorrow night on Friday, um, but Saturday uh, is Kiss Me Kosher, and the discussion will be at 7.30, as all of them. Again, you have 72 hours to watch the movie after you click it. Um, I don't know why I find this so amazing, but I do. And, <laughs> and um, you can, uh, it's one link for all of the uh, discussion sessions. So the one you click tonight, you, you can use for all of them. Um, uh, I forget who's talking. Um, for Maureen. Maureen, Maureen, is Maureen, is talking. Maureen. Maureen is talking. And, yes. Um, and yeah. we'll see. It's going to be an interesting response. And uh, Maureen swears that she really likes for rom-coms. So I figured, okay, do this one. All right. Well, okay, everybody. Good night and good Shabbos. What an update. Um, great read. Mm -hmm.